So uh, kia ora koutou, everyone, and welcome to the fifth session. Today we are joined by another presenter, my colleague Quentin Painter, and we've talked in some of the earlier sessions about some of the wonderful work that was done in the Cook Islands, and Quentin led that project. He's also uh, leading the Vanuatu work. So welcome, Quentin, and um, great to have you joining so today we're going to talk about um, how we figure out a program of work. As we've mentioned already, there are always so many weeds, it's not always an easy decision about where to start. So I'm going to hand over now to Michael and he's going to talk us through um, the first couple of steps when we're determining a program of work. Okay, thanks Lenny. Okay, so as Lindy says, when, we, when we're looking at trying to work out importing by natural enemies, we've got a whole stack of weeds in our countries. Some countries have got over 300 species, others 100. So how are you gonna determine which ones are priorities and what, um, whether there's biocontrol agents? So I'm gonna talk about the first two about how to look at the priorities and what's already been done. And there's a, a file on the shared drive at the moment. It's only a draft, but I'll, um, I'm gonna finalize it and, and send it to Dave and we can put it up on the Facebook page and, and the um, background sites. So we can't do all the weeds, we need to um, choose some. So we've got to draw up a list of possible options. So we'll just move on to the next slide. I think it's probably the best one. So one of the things we can look at is what are the priority weeds and what has already been done and what weeds are you most concerned about? And some of these will be standout species. And so if you've got your 200 odd species found in your country, you could probably whittle it down to 10 or 20 species. There's a lot, vast majority of species which are they out there, but they're just not of, of priority, so you can get rid of those. And then we can look at using our tables, um, what is already out there or what's available in terms of natural enemies. And I touched earlier in the week, I, I um, went through the table very briefly, but Lenny and I think we, what we might do um, is have a different session because the table the file has about seven tables and it might take a bit of time to just go through each one. But in short, what we'd look at is in the tables, we look at the name, the weeds in your country, then you can look at what weeds are targets for, for biological control, i.e. what weeds have already got natural enemies available for them. And then you can start looking at if any of these are priorities and then if they are, then you can start looking at what agents or what natural enemies you can import. If none of the weeds, which are a priority for you, um, have natural enemies available, and that's possible, um, Quentin will go through that process with you on how to prioritize weeds for, um, for future work. Um, so we don't go to the tables. So the and then for some weeds like lantana, we have 20 biological or 20 natural enemies. We then have tried to prioritize those agents, which one, which are the natural enemies, which are the better ones to, to go through. So the tables are in various steps. And this morning I'm going through a set of instructions that will go with that table. that will help you walk you through it um, later on. When we were in, Lindy and I were in Tonga and Nui, we found that some of the weeds we, we came up with or were discussing, uh, people weren't necessarily familiar with. And so we decided that we were going to prepare a, a fact sheet or a, a, an ID sheet, if you like, of each of the weeds which have got natural enemies available or which are the weeds 
in which natural enemies are being researched and will be soon available. So that is now um, on the, in, at SPREP, um, there's 132, I think, um, um, of these sheets. So not all weeds you've got in your country will have um, a sheet, but if the sheet is, about, uh, is there, um, it is a target for um, biological control or for natural enemy research. Um, but just to add to that, it is available on the shared drive. We are looking to making this information um, more easily accessible in the future on the web, because at the moment you'll have to download the whole file, which is quite big. So we will look to improve that experience in the future so you can just access the sheets you're interested in. And I'll just point out a couple of features. Um, we are trying to collect up local names. We know the local names are really important for um, having conversations about what weeds we're talking about. You guys are the experts about what your local names are. And so we'll be seeking um, input from you if we are missing your local names. And we know we only have a subset of them so far. And there's also a useful links section here, which will take you through to more information about these weeds, including um, ID keys and so on. So um, this, yeah, we hope, hope you find these useful for helping to figure out what weeds you've got. Right. Next slide. Okay, so in step two, we can draw up a list of possible options. And so if we look through the table, um, and that's on the shared drive as well. So go to the, um, I think the tab is the, um, the PICS, Buyer Control or BC Targets um, matrix. And you can click down on your country and you can highlight the weeds which are present in your country and what natural enemies are currently available. And each of the, the weeds are color coded. So weeds which are green tend to have natural enemies which are already in the Pacific and they'll be easier to move around than weeds which are, I say, a shade of blue. And the agents are also color coded. So the hot, darker the green, the more, um, the, the better the agent is, i.e. that it has a higher impact on that target. And so um, I think on Monday it was when we looked at that, that table, we can click on a particular country, up comes the weeds only which are present on that country. We can then look through the agents and choose an agent which is rated one or a, a dark green. And that means it's a, a available in the Pacific causing high impacts on that target weed. And you could choose that agent as opposed to an agent which is say a blue color, which means we may, might need to do some host testing. But I think we'll just go through, have a different session for that. Um, because there is a bit to get through, it is a bit complex, but it allows us to help choose which natural enemy is appropriate for your country if that particular weed species is a priority. The table also tells us what natural enemies might be available in the near future. And so there's a number of um, agents or natural enemies, and you can see the two, the bottom two left-hand photos. That is a, a beetle on Solanum torven, which has been worked on in, by Quentin in Auckland. And the pigeon to the right is a tingered on Urena labata, also being worked on by, by Quentin in Auckland. And once the testing has been done, if appropriate, these natural enemies will be released in, initially in Vanuatu, and then they'll be more available to other countries if these two species are um, priorities. We have, on the far right, we have um, a wasp on Aranda Donax, that's a, a, a very tall grass. This wasp is, has been released in the US. Um, 
And so because it's not in the Pacific, we may need to do some additional testing depending on what species the US have tested and what closely related species to Arundo are found in the Pacific and not tested in the US. So on those ones, some additional species, we don't need to test them all again, but we just might need to test one or two species before we bring them into the Pacific. And the one in the middle, um, what's that one? Okay, so this is um, the Albizia, or the uh, yes. Molucana. This is a potential natural enemy, a fungus, that we're interested in exploring further. I'll just point out too, this wasp is actually in New Zealand, so part of the Pacific, <laughs> but of course we have a slightly different flora, so yeah, we have to look at um, what other testing might be needed. Should I move on to the next slide? Yeah, I think so. I think just before we go, because um, this is now Quentin stuff, what we'll do is we'll have a session on going through the table um, and then I'll also finish off the instruction sheet and all this will be made available to everybody. Um, so please don't get too concerned about it now. It's just an introductory of what resources are available. And I'll let your hand over to Quentin on how to prioritise weeds. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. Yes, yeah, so uh, it's been something we've been working on probably for the last decade or so is to try and uh, work out a system uh, that can prioritize weeds effectively and uh, tries to remove sort of personal biases from how we choose which weeds we target. And uh, the history of this is quite funny given that Michael's Australian um, because um, the federal government in Australia wanted all the states and territories to uh, prioritize targets for biological control of weeds and they couldn't agree. Um, and so the Australian government uh, put the job up to tender and uh, we uh, in New Zealand actually got the job of prioritizing weeds for Australia. And so we've been um, developing this system for some time now. Um, we've been uh, developing one for New Zealand as well, and also collaborating with people in, us in South Africa. And basically it, it boils down to a couple of things when you're selecting a, a target for biocontrol, you want to make sure you select the best target weed. So you have to make sure that the weed's really important, um, but also you want to choose a, a, a target where biocontrol is likely to work. So there's a, there's a real balance there. If, if you can get both, then it's fantastic. Um, and so, yeah, as I said, um, we've been developing these scoring systems and we've sort of run them through against historical projects and they seem to work fairly well. Um, we've also run about 100 Pacific weeds through the system. And uh, yeah, it's based on the, uh, the sort of understanding that the best targets are going to be those that provide the best value for money. Um, and as uh, Mike alluded to previously, <laughs> Um, repeat programs are cheaper than novel programs. So if a biocontrol target has been a subject to a program somewhere else in the world, then that means that the surveys to look for biocontrol agents would have already been done. And it means that the host specificity testing may have been almost completely done. Uh, so you may only need to test one or two more extra species to demonstrate that something's safe to release in, release in the Pacific. Um, and it's also easy to estimate the impact of a repeat program. So as Mike mentioned, if something's been highly successful in a past program, then there's a really good chance it's going to be successful again. Whereas if something was unsuccessful in a, in a previous program, then you wouldn't really bet uh, very much money on it being a success if you tried again somewhere else. So I'll move on to the next slide. And so, um, yeah, so basically we've developed a scoring system and um, a good way of, of uh, picking your, your ideal targets is to then have a, a matrix where if you look on the, the uh, top of the matrix, we have uh, weed importance as low, medium or high. And so, yeah, basically, if you can determine how much of a problem a weed is causing you, then, uh, then generally we, we try and make a score out of that and categorize it. Um, and then on the left hand side, we have the feasibility of using natural enemies. Uh, some of that will be based on whether the weed has been a previous target, 
Uh, but also we have some predictions based on the traits of weeds, which I presume we don't have time to go into here. Um, but certain traits, for example, some weeds uh, only reproduce clonally. Uh, so they're genetically all very uniform uh, and they make much easier targets, for example, than weeds that reproduce sexually and have a lot of genetic mixing. Um, so we can predict whether a novel target is likely to be an easy or a difficult target as well. And then obviously your ideal weed that you really want to tackle first is something which is a really important weed in your particular country um, and also predicted to be uh, a good target for biocontrol where you predict that biocontrol is going to have a high impact. And obviously the worst target, the one you really don't want to go for, is something that's relatively low importance and one where you think biocontrol is not going to make much of a difference. And then obviously there's various uh, intermediate scores. So, and, and here's where a little bit of um, local knowledge really is, is important when we're coming to decide which one to go for. So for example, a weed of medium importance, but low feasibility of biocontrol will have a similar score overall to a weed that has a medium chance of biocontrol succeeding. Um, but say only a, a, a medium importance or low importance. And so, yeah, basically we need local knowledge uh, for people to say, look, we'd rather tackle the most important weeds, even if biocontrol is less likely to work compared to, you know, having a chance of su success against weeds that aren't, aren't quite so important. Okay, we can move on to the next slide. So uh, a lot of the detail in how we do this uh, will be give, is, is in this uh, report that just came out recently. Uh, so that explains all the different scoring systems and how we add everything up. Uh, but it focuses on how we score the cost of weed biocontrol programs. Um, and that's largely based on whether it's a repeat program or a novel program. Um, as I mentioned before, um, repeat programs are a lot cheaper than novel programs. And it's also largely based on the predicted impact of biocontrol. Uh, there are various systems for assessing how important a weed is. And we discussed that, but obviously uh, we haven't been able to do that for each uh, country in the Pacific yet. And that's something that we need to do um, before we can get the overall score and overall priorities worked out. I might just mention that again, this is some information we're going to be working with SPREP to find a way to make it a bit more user friendly for you to look up on the web. Um, but I'll give you an example. Um, so when we uh, started the, the project in the Cook Islands back in 2012, uh, we had a workshop um, and we were quite lucky. Um, the Cook Islands has a, a biodiversity database and um, that actually ranks weeds by how important they are. And in the database, they had a list of 46 serious weeds of the Cook Islands. And so what we did was we invited 12 local delegates um, and they had a range of different uh, level um, expertises. So some people were from forestry, some from horticulture, livestock, and then there were biodiversity conservation people and biosecurity people. So we had a wide range of, of people who, who had a vested interest in biocontrol of weeds. And, um, and we got them basically to prioritize the target weeds. So, so we really didn't have any impact, impact. And I think that was really useful. Um, so basically we went through each of the 46 serious weeds and we basically asked people if they thought they were high importance, medium importance or low importance. And basically just counted the number of votes for each weed and then, and then counted up the score. So, you know, the maximum score that something can get was 12 delegates all voting high importance for a particular weed. So, so a weed could score 120 points if everyone thought it was a really serious uh, problem. And for us, it was, it was quite an eye opener because there were some potentially very easy biocontrol targets that we thought would, uh, would rank highly, um, but people just didn't want them to be controlled. So uh, I think if we'd been allowed to do what we thought was good, uh, we would have come up with a very different list to, to the local people. So it, it certainly brought it home to us that having local people selecting uh, the importance of the weeds is, is really, really important. 
So we can move on to the next slide. And so we then calculated an overall score and there's various different ways of doing it. Um, for the Cook Islands, we just added the weed importance score that was based on everyone's votes to what we call the natural enemy score. And this was basically the predicted impact of biocontrol, whether we thought it would cause a 100% reduction in the weed or a 50% reduction or, or say only a 10% reduction in the weed. And that was based on previous impacts for repeat biocontrol programs and predicted impacts for novel biocontrol programs. And then we took away the cost score from that. So basically, if something was going to cost a lot, that um, reduced its uh, overall score. Whereas if something was cheap, it would uh, reduce the score by a smaller amount. And that gave us an overall list, which I think is coming up next. And um, yeah, and, and um, it worked generally pretty well, except for the very top weed, which is uh, slightly embarrassing um, because lots of people voted for a Rundo Donax stating it was a really serious weed in the Cook Islands. Uh, but when we actually went out to look for potential release sites for biocontrol agents, we found that people had actually misidentified um, a lot of the infestations. And they were actually Penicetum purpureum. And uh, it turned out that Arundo donax is actually incredibly rare in the Cook Islands. We only found one, one relatively small patch of it. So in the end, we decided that we wouldn't proceed with biocontrol against Arundo. Um, but we did uh, proceed with biocontrol against uh, the remaining weeds all the way down to Cidium catalianum. Uh, that's, that's, just, that's the number we could do before the, uh, the funding just wasn't su uh, sufficient to include any more. So we introduced biocontrol agents against Xanthium, Mycania, Cardiospermum, Passiflorus, Pathodia, and Cidium. And to avoid waste, we released the um, Arundo agents in New Zealand instead. So they are yeah, still available I mean. for the Pacific. <laughs> so and I got... might just um, add, we've done this exercise also in Niue and in Tonga. And we have um, ranked tables like this for those countries as well. If I can, if I can just say that, this is the the rationale behind producing those 132 sheets is that um, you know application of weeds does occur. Um, it's quite common not only in the Pacific but also Asia and Africa and elsewhere. So uh, we just thought it was a good resource where people can just double check. And yeah, just to conclude, as I mentioned, uh, we think each country needs to determine its priorities. Um, as I mentioned in the Cook Islands, for example, uh, some weeds like salvinia and uh, water hyacinth um, would have been very easy biocontrol targets for us. Uh, but the reality is that in the Cook Islands, they don't have any big uh, rivers or lakes um, that are clogged by these particular plants. And in fact, people actually quite like them. Uh, water hyacinth is quite attractive for one thing, but it's also a nitrogen fixer. And so they actually like it in the taro fields uh, for adding nitrogen. Um, and so, yeah, if we'd actually biocontrolled it, it would have been very unpopular. So it's, it's really important that each country determines their priorities. And uh, we can provide information and recommendation, uh, particularly in terms of potential biocontrol impacts uh, to help inform decisions. Um, and we also need to have some regional con conversations about regional priorities. Um, particularly in terms of the new and emerging weeds to target because, you know, emerging uh, and new weeds are quite expensive things to tackle. So we really do need to make sure that we are spending our money wisely. And I'll just mention here, um, the SPREP team are going to be organising at some point uh, a workshop to try and talk about the regional priorities. Um, that's something that MFAT is very keen for us to do to make sure we are putting our effort in the right areas. So um, watch the space for that regional conversation. So thank you, Quentin. And now we're gonna open up to Mentimeter. Have you got any questions that you'd like to ask about how to determine a, a project, a program of work based on what Quentin's just presented? I'll just give you a minute to type in any questions that you'd like answered. I guess it is always quite hard to um, 
to choose because there's so many weeds and there's never never enough money but this process does at least seem to determine the best priorities that can be agreed. I can see somebody's typing so I'll just can a country use lists of weeds that have been decided by groups of organizations? Do you want to answer that one, Quentin? Um, I'm not quite sure in terms of which organizations, I suppose, but um, I guess in terms of importance, um, if they've been assessed elsewhere, um, it would certainly help you. I guess too, um, what we what we are aware of is there's all kinds of lists out there. There are multiple lists of weeds, and sometimes you know they don't all have the same same species or in the same order, and that's where I think it's so important to get all those people together that we mentioned on the previous slide that need to be part of this conversation, and have a really robust discussion about what the priorities are for your country because it might be that that list has been created by someone who doesn't see the whole picture or is only interested in maybe weeds that affect agriculture or weeds that affect um, biodiversity. So the more points of view you can have, the better and we're getting better and better information around the, those other parts of that maths equation about how how good a target is it going to be how likely are we to be successful and how easy and cheap is it going to be to do the work but the bit that we really need is that local knowledge and agreement around what weeds really are the most important and Lee, can i give an example of, of a sure. workshop we had in fiji a few years ago where we asked various um, organisations to attend and it was quite interesting in that the weeds that the environment people listed as their top 10 weeds had very little overlap with the top 10 weeds that the agricultural people listed as their most top as their top 10 weeds and so I think when we got the list together we had about 27 or so top 10 weeds and so this is where Quentin's um, priority scoring system comes into place because it allows both organisations then to start ranking those weeds um, because you've got the, the list will get larger and larger depending on who is in the room listing their top top weeds. So it's a system to allow that those different views to come to the fore. So I'll just make a start on answering this question and I'm sure Michael and Quentin will also think of some more barriers. Well, one of them is obviously if we're not entirely sure what weeds you have in your country or if they haven't been correctly identified or they've been overlooked. But also um, making sure that everybody has their say and we know what it can be like sitting in a room with more senior people they might have a louder voice, but they might not actually know the most information. So processes where we can actually get all of the input um, from everybody who has a contribution to make. Michael and Quint, do you, can you think of any other barriers? Well, I think um, Mike was right that, I mean, one of the big issues is that uh, people often score weeds of agriculture differently to to environmental weeds and it's it's quite a tricky thing to score them on the same scale um, agricultural weeds it's fairly easy to figure out their cost because you can calculate how much time people spent weeding or or how much they spend on herbicides or or other forms of control whereas calculating the cost of a weed that's destroying native forest is is much harder um, and um, that's that's a real barrier to try and, and figure out how you're going to come up with a, a scheme that, that prioritizes both sets of weeds in the, in the same scoring system. So maybe um, you just score them separately and say, we'll come up with the top 
three agricultural weeds and the top three environmental weeds and we'll buy control those or something i mean there's different ways you can approach it but but it's um it's not an easy thing to do no look, I, I tend to agree there it's it is difficult because also what we can see is that some weeds are, are quite um are quite common but they might only be um found along roadsides and they're not actually having an impact and so trying to determine the impacts can be a little bit difficult but yeah maybe that when we're looking at, at um, priority weeds um, choosing some which are environmental and some which are agricultural is, is possibly a way but um, maybe you need to have that discussion when you've sort of gone through your priority process and everybody's had their say and just one other one too is sometimes when do you prioritise the weeds which are only just starting to get going yeah. but you know they're going to be bad based on what you've seen elsewhere and it can be difficult to persuade people to worry about a weed when it's not very common yet um, so that's yeah another you know another part of the mix as well so um, some more questions coming in yeah. so have you faced any problems when trying to determine priorities with so many stakeholders? My experience is it's actually gone really well. Quentin, your experience? Well, I think that was the case in the Cook Islands. I think it, it, it did actually work very well. There was a lot of agreement over many of the weeds and the top weeds, I think, did come out pretty well. Um, some of the barriers, I think, were there's definitely one or two weeds where people value them so in in the cook islands for example albizia or falcataria um, was actually valued because they use the wood to make boats um, and uh, i don't know whether that's actually something we can overcome in terms of getting a biocontrol program going there um, another barrier we've had is is when some plants we don't really know if they're native or exotic um, and so, yeah, that's that's the other big one. So what was Marimia peltata and now Decalobanthus peltatus? A um, lot of people think it's a horrible weed in the Cook Islands, but it's currently listed as a native species. Um, that that really makes it hard to, uh, to get a biocontrol program going against it. So we talked um, last week about conflicts of interest and that some weeds have beneficial uses. So this process is very good for determining um, where weeds have beneficial uses and there might be opposition to using natural enemies to control them or it's just not not the right thing to do. Um, I think another key tip is make sure you feed people a good lunch when you're having these workshops. I think one of the things that does come out is that while you might get a vast array of, of weeds there's usually about one or two which everyone is intending to, to tends to agree on, and that's because even the environmental people often have farms, and so they're going to be putting on their environmental hat, but they're also a farmer themselves, and so not always, but sometimes one or two weeds will just float to the top because weeds impact on a number of, of ecosystems and people are across ecosystems and environments as well. So here's a question for you, Quentin. How effective is the scoring system? Interested but still confused. Right, yeah, well, I guess I didn't have time to go into a great deal of detail about um, the scoring system. In terms of uh, scoring a target uh, weed as a good or medium or poor target for biocontrol, um, I think the system's pretty good at identifying really good targets. Um, so if something's been successful multiple times overseas, it will come to the top. Uh, chances are that it will be successful if you repeat the program. And I think the system's pretty good at determining whether a weed's going to be a really, really difficult target. There's an awful large grey area where weeds are sort of classified as medium or intermediate targets and um, what we know from looking at the past history of biocontrol that means they're likely to either be successful or unsuccessful they don't tend to come out in the middle and we're not very good at se separating the, the the winners from the losers if they, if they only score an intermediate score um, so the system's 
okay, but it's not perfect, but it's probably the best we can do with the current amount of data that's out there. I might just add to that something that we've learned that's been important here in New Zealand is that you don't want to tackle a whole lot of really difficult projects and only have difficult projects because we need to be able to deliver results and show progress to keep funders uh, on board and stakeholders on board. So ideally, um, if you're taking on difficult ones, you need some more straightforward ones as well to balance things out. So we often sort of take what we call a portfolio approach because there are some difficult projects that need to be tackled, but just doing those alone is not um, an easy easy path. So having a mixture is, is a probably a better way forward. Yeah. Just to give you a quick example of that, if we look at the, uh, well, Quentin can give one on Cook Islands, but in Vanuatu, we introduced some agents which have already been released in Australia or other countries, as well as tackling some new target weeds as well. So we've got some new weed agents coming in quickly where they've done a very good job in other countries. And then we've got our longer time term research ones where we've got to actually look for agents. And that was a nice mix there. And Quentin can talk about Cook's. Yeah, well, actually, I was just going to make the point as well that, um, you know, even though we identify some weeds as difficult targets for biocontrol, where you might expect that the impact's only going to be small, um, if it's a really important weed, then a small reduction in a really important weed could still provide quite significant economic benefits compared to a major reduction in a really unimportant weed. Um, and so that's why it's really important when you're coming up with a prioritization score to consider how important a weed is, as well as what the biocontrol impacts are likely to be. So, uh, you know, I think a, an example worldwide is, um, you know, many countries, I think Pacific's lucky, but in many countries, biocontrol of lantana hasn't been very successful. Uh, it's been pretty good generally in the Pacific. Um, but uh, even so, uh, I think in Australia, they've calculated that the benefits of biocontrol of lantana, even though it hasn't been hugely successful, have, have outweighed the costs. Mm. Right, so this question here, um, if you've identified a target weed already, is, it post do you, is that all you need, I guess, is just to paraphrase. I think the thing about if you've gone through a process without using the information that we can now make available around the likelihood of success and the sort of cost and the ease, you've, you've, you're only sort of part way there really in terms of your decision making. So it might still be that that weed is still the top priority, but being able to factor in all of the parts of the, the puzzle, you're probably going to be more comfortable with um, the list Oh, and, and it's more defendable as well. Do you do a full island consultation before prioritising a weed? Well, this is actually um, a question maybe for um, people, the, our audience, <laughs> maybe um, they can submit something uh, via the chat. I, I, I think there is sometimes quite extensive consultation. I know that was the case in Niue, um, but in other other instances, I know it's quite difficult to do consultation and people can get over consulted about everything. So sometimes we need to bring together a subset of people who can be consulted rather than um, trying to consult everybody on an island. Are there any other contacts organisations in the Pacific that specialise in NEN's work? Who should we trust given the issues we now face with biocontrol agents turning invasives? Okay, well, this is quite an interesting question. <laughs> um, I am not aware, and correct me if I'm wrong, Quentin and Michael, of any other organisations who are developing natural enemies currently. I know in the past, um, SPC has done some work um, I know some of the research organisations in some of the French territories have done some work. There's um, colleagues in Hawaii who are doing some work. I'm finding out more about our, our Fijian team tomorrow and what they're doing. 
but I don't. Is, uh, have I missed any anybody? No, look, in, in short, there, there were a lot more organisations in the 70s and 80s than there are now. It's, it's almost like, apart from Hawaii, New Zealand, and my organisation, um, there's no real other organisations which are specialising in NEN's work in the Pacific. Yeah, so I guess it would just be USDA with their work in, in Hawaii and Guam, yeah. places like that. So you have to trust us. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think um, this is a, you know, a really, really good question that we talked in the very first session about how some things were done in the old days that were very foolish, where organisms were introduced to countries without really thinking through um, what was going to happen. And in particular, generalists, things that don't specialize just on a single weed, things that will feed on lots of different things. And it was always going to be a disaster and it was very foolish. So I hope we've given you the impression through this training that we are absolute sticklers for international best practice. If you work with us, we will take the long way and do it properly. And if in doubt, we won't do it because we're in the we're here to help create solutions, enduring and, and safe and effective solutions. And we're not interested in being involved in work that's going to create problems. And um, we know that we can do this work safely, but I think you do need to be careful about who you trust because there's an awful lot of expertise that needs to sit in behind these projects. People who can interpret the data, people who can set up appropriate trials, having access to containment facilities. Um, all of those things are you know, not that widely available. So great question, thank you. I think Lovely. one of the things I'd like to make Oh, hang on, is there a question? Did you want to say something, Dave? It sounds like Dave. Yeah, I wanted to add something. Sure. So I know how hard it is for you to blow your own trumpet. But just to be clear, um, how we determine who our PRISMS partners are for each particular program, we look at quite a few things. Um, the first is that the organisation provides the uh, best practice. Um, no. We wouldn't be recommending anything to any countries that we didn't believe in 100% and that the organisation was um, providing best practice, was safe, um, and we believe that they're the best people to assist you. Um, there's also quite a few other factors, such as, you know, there are other organisations that um, develop natural enemies and some of them have been <laughs> mentioned already, you know, out of Hawaii, uh, used to be Mike in Australia, but a lot of these organisations uh, don't have the capability to provide a service for you. So Landcare is able to do that um, through their institutional uh, rules. Um, so th that's another reason why we choose Landcare to do the work. And we also know that um, Lindley and Mike and Quentin they know everyone, pretty much everyone in the world who works on biocontrol, they're all their colleagues. When you get um, land care, you're not just getting land care, you're getting all the expertise of biocontrol experts all around the world. Um, and the other thing we use to determine who is going to be a PRISM's partner is the commitment and dedication and all the past work that they have put into the Pacific, including considerable co-financing, co um, support. You know, we don't we don't just check go and choose someone to recommend for work in the Pacific. Um, there's a lot of thought processes and a lot of things that we consider. And I can certainly endorse uh, land care research as the best available option. Well, thank can you, Dave. Can I just make a comment on that? I think the other thing, and, and I appreciate David's comments about that. And it's a nice glowing recommendation. But for Quentin, Nini and I, there's, um, there's a bit more at risk here because if we give you bad advice or we introduce duds or we do something which is unscientific, then history is gonna catch up on us. 
and will be made accountable for, our countries will be made accountable, our organisations will be made accountable for, and biocontrol will also be um, further hit. So it's not in our interest to do things which are shoddy, which will come back and bite everybody, um, not just the regions, but also our own organisations. And one of the things that I think you'll find, and David's obviously alluded to that by his endorsement, is that he's found some people who are, are trustworthy in, in delivering best practice and not um, repeating mistakes or errors in the past. Thanks. So Quint, question here for you about how long it took for the Cook Islands to come up with your priority list. Yeah, it, it, um, it was a variety of uh, different things, I suppose. The, the actual weed prioritisation process was largely done in a one day workshop. Um, so yeah, the actual voting for the 46 species didn't take a huge amount of time. Uh, there were additional weeds that people wanted to nominate as well that we put through the process, even though they weren't uh, listed as priority weeds on the Cook Island database. So we, we included those. Um, the extra time um, came in really um, determining how how likely they were be uh, sorry their their amenability in terms of biocontrol targets. So I had to review the literature to see which of those uh, weeds had already been targets elsewhere and what the impacts were um, for species that hadn't been targeted for biocontrol previously. I had to run them through our our um, predictive uh, model which is based on a range of different traits that plants have. So um, yeah, the initial selection of the most important species was quick, uh, but the follow-up to predict the biocontrol impacts probably took me a couple of weeks to, to sort out and develop the overall score. Thanks. Have you had any problems with organisations and farmers deciding priority weeds? We've stuck to our process and I think it's, it's worked pretty well. The only one I can think of was whether we engage in biocontrol for Mycania, and that was because farmers view, in, in one way anyway, viewed Mycania as a good plant for um, soil, and also they wanted it for medicinal medicine. So we decided that we weren't gonna go down there until we had um, sorted out that conflict of interest Yes, we can share this information with you. Um, if we haven't, I don't think we have actually already got this up on the shared drive, but um, we, we can do that. And um, we can certainly work, walk, walk you through this if you need some more assistance. Portfolio print, love it, great. Is Tonga's weed table available online? No, it's not, but no, I can share it. It is on I think the shared. I mean the, prior, the prioritized one, Mike, that we developed at the workshop is what I'm interpreting. If it's just information about weeds, yes, it's on in Michael's um, Excel that he um, shared. So thank you for all those wonderful questions. What we are doing is um, creating a list of frequently asked questions and providing some written answers. So once we've worked through that, we will also make that available on the shared drive. So now, is anybody keen to start a NENS program that doesn't already have one? Interested to hear if that's the case. Yes? Still not sure? Okay, so... Um, the people who said yes, oh, I'll just give another few minutes for these to come in. So we've got four people who are keen and three that are still not quite sure. Six now that are keen to start. Seven, going up. <laughs> Where are you from? The country, which countries are interested in starting a, a NENS program, just so we know who we need to be talking to? If you're too shy, you can 
obviously contact us later. Okay, Samoa. RMI, Tonga. Solomons. Fantastic. Fiji. Okay, so we do have a project um, with Tonga and with RMI. I presume kingdom means kingdom of Tonga. Well, well, well. <laughs> We're getting down to islands now. And Tuvalu, yes, we have a project with you. So we need to be talking to the Solomons and to Fiji and to um, Samoa. Samoa. Thanks. Great. So what we're going to do now is we're going to have a recap. I know we've covered a lot of material and really interested. In fact, this is a picture from Vivao. Some of you may remember there's Michael showing people how to find um, the um, nail grass salad. No, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, and we did find it there. Um, we're going to just cover off the key points that I want you to, to go away with from this training and just see how much you can remember. So first of all, we, I know we've been through this a couple of times, but we do really need to stop new weeds coming into our countries. That's really important. You've got enough already. We don't need any more. We need to detect new weeds early when they first start to appear on the landscape and get rid of them. Don't wait till they've really spread and, and covered the island. If there's a couple of bushes of something popping up that's a weed, if you're not sure, you can send photos in. We can tell you what the plant is, give you some advice. Pull them out, cut them down, burn them, get rid of them. Stop weeds being spread from island to island. If you've got islands that are clean of weeds, don't um, spread them around, contain them. And when all else has failed, then we need to look seriously at using natural enemies um, for the most serious and widespread species. So now I want to hear from you. What can you remember? What are the advantages of using natural enemies to control weeds? Just give us some key words. Cost-effective, chemical-free, sustainable, long-term and safe, excellent. But we also have to remember the disadvantages. So what are the other things we have to bear in mind if we're going down the natural enemy approach? Yeah, it can take a long time to do all the work, to do it properly, to have all the right conversations with your communities, to do all the research. And that can cost money. And yes, sometimes it might not work. We might find a natural enemy and release it and it might not even survive. Um, what else have we got here? We have to work through the conflicts of interest and... So sometimes um, we may not need be able to tackle a weed if our community is saying to us that they value the weed instead. Um, what else we got here? Yes, you've got to have the right resources. You've got to have the time, the team, and the patience. Great. So um, just in case we didn't have any answers, I popped them up. So I think we've... Um, pretty much covered all of these, except maybe we didn't talk about the fact there's no health risks associated with using the natural enemies for weeds. Some of the weeds themselves, though, um, pose health risks. Plants like Parthenium, people can be very allergic to, so often the weeds are actually more um, dangerous than the natural enemies for us. Um, it can be advantage that we're not eradicating the weed, because then it's always going to be there if people need a few leaves for a, a herbal remedy or want the occasional tree for shade, but just not spreading and spreading. And the fact that it works gradually can be a good thing. We talked about how that means you have a chance to rehabilitate your landscape and your ecosystem 
and replace those weeds with beneficial plants. If we take the weeds away too quickly, we might just end up with more weeds of different kind. We might end up with an unstable landscape where a flood comes through and everything gets washed away because there are no plants, roots in the soil to hold the soil together. And of course the advantage is that we can ensure that we only attack the target plant. And the disadvantage is we covered all of those, I think, um, yeah, that we need some, land managers need to understand. And uh, sometimes if they don't understand, then they might disrupt the natural enemies by doing things like mowing a weed at the wrong time of the year and killing the natural enemy. So we're going to hear from you again now. Do you think natural enemies for weeds is safe? based on what we've discussed. So we've got 11 people saying yes, 13, 14. It'll be interesting um, to compare. We asked this question in the first session and I don't think we had quite so many yeses. I think we had a few more people that weren't sure. So um, great that you're feeling more comfortable now about the safety of this approach. And so how do we actually know it's safe? What can we refer to? What information have we got? so we can um, be very targeted, just find natural enemies that will only attack a single weed and nothing else. We know there aren't any health risks to people or animals. We're not using chemicals. We know it's safe because of the testing and the procedures and the centrifugal approach which allows us to choose which plants we need to test, the ones that will be most likely to be at risk. And yes, the long process of research, the thoroughness this has done, the host testing. And remember too, there's a hundred years of information. So worldwide, the use of natural enemies for weeds has been done now for a very long time, including in the Pacific. And that is very well documented work there's an international database we can look up. And so there's lots and lots of information that we can draw on to tell us that it is, is safe and successful. Okay, so yes, this is just the key point. So remember 91 countries globally have introduced at least one natural enemy. And in the Pacific, 17 PICTs have released a total of 68 natural enemies against 27 weeds. And I think that surprises quite a lot of people because they're not aware that that work has been done. And when we are successful, the weeds disappear and people forget about them. And if we haven't documented the projects, if we don't have good photos and good stories and data, then the projects get forgotten. And so natural enemies has, in the last 10 or 20 years, become a forgotten tool in a lot of the Pacific. And um, we know that we can detect, we can, we can predict what plants would be at risk from natural enemies. And if in doubt, we don't proceed. Right, so we're gonna ask you a couple more questions now. Do you think that natural enemies can successfully control weeds? Based on what we've shared with you, these sessions. Okay, so we've got a, a couple of don't knows, but um, 
we've got 15 and possibly climbing people answering yes. So what examples of success can you share? What examples of success have you heard about during these sessions? And there's a growing number of them for the Pacific. So any of the natural enemies we've talked about or any of the weeds that we've talked about, those before and after photos, can you remember what they were? Yes, calligrapha beetle or broomweed beetle or cider beetle, lots of common names for that one. Yes, broomweed. must be um, hard to remember back to the first session where we showed a lot of those before and afters, but uh, we showed some other really um, good before and after pictures of some of those um, aquatic weeds. Yep, the water lettuce and the water hyacinth. We've had some really good results with lantana. The mile a minute, Do you remember those pictures we showed from the Cook Islands where we had trees covered in vines they were mile a minute, they were red passion fruit and they were grand balloon vine and we were able to show pictures then of those trees um, no longer covered in those vines. And there are many more other successful projects. And what we know from again looking worldwide about a third of programs are so successful you don't need any other control such as down in the bottom picture here, I think this is water hyacinth, and then the same river is now completely clear and no other work is required to keep that water clear. Half of them are partially successful, so they might work in some habitats but not in others, they might work better in the shade or then in the sun or on the wet side of the island than the dry side of the island, and only about a sixth are not successful have no impact and that's usually because the funds run out before you are able to do all of the work you need to do to find a successful lineup of natural enemies. We're getting better at um, predicting which natural enemies will be successful and we also know that um, the ones that we have, the tried and true agents, particularly in the Pacific, uh, if we use those again we have a really high chance of success so if we do more of these projects in the Pacific, I think some of these numbers might even go higher in terms of success. We talked about the very careful process that we follow when we are developing an NENS program. So let's see what we can remember about this. So again, hearing from you, what are the things we need to consider when we're deciding if a project's going to be feasible? It was quite a long list of things that we needed to think about and get information about. Can you remember what some of those were? Yes, we need to know what is our desired outcome. If it's a rapid eradication, then um, using natural enemies is probably not going to be the answer. Distribution, yes, we need to know where the weed is and where it's come from. We need to know, yes, is it going to be money? How much is it going to cost? We need to land the money too. There's basically um, lots and lots and lots of information that we need to think about. Yep, who are the, yeah, who's affected, who would help with the work, what work needs to be done. So this is just a bit of a summary. Um, 
we really need to understand the relationship between that weed and other plants. Are there any natural enemies that are known? Beneficial uses or conflicts of interest? Other obstacles? Um, it's going to make, COVID has been a bit of an obstacle. <laughs> it wasn't one we ever put into one of our feasibility reports, but um, not being able to travel and do work, being locked down is a bit of an obstacle. The likelihood of success, and Quentin was talking about that work um, just before, how can we predict which ones are going to be the winners? And another really important one, are we going to need to tackle several weeds all at the same time? If we just take out one, is it only going to be replaced by two more, like those vines in the Cook Islands or the pasture weeds we're tackling in Vanuatu? Do we need to actually work on a whole bunch all at the same time in order to get the results we need? And yeah, where does this fit in the terms of priorities? Again, I want to hear from you. Why do we do surveys in country and or overseas as our second step once we have decided to proceed with a project? Why do we do that? Yes, we need to make sure that um, the weed has been correctly identified and often we need to work out, particularly if it's a brand new novel target, um, where, does, where in the world does it come from and where is a match for the native range or is the weed, if it's the same species all over the Pacific, is it all the same genetics or is it different? And yes, we need the baseline information. If we don't have the information about how bad and where these weeds are now, how are we going to be able to tell our stories in the future? We need to make sure that none of our natural enemies have already turned up. Um, every time Michael and I go on surveys in country, Michael always finds things that haven't been recorded before. And um, so we also want to look for if there's anything that's going to disrupt our natural enemies, if you have a weed that's covered in aggressive ants, for example, that's always a bit of a concern that they might be um, very hard on a natural enemy and you might need to choose something like a plant disease rather than an insect. And sometimes we've got to do overseas surveys because we need to find out what natural enemies even exist because no one's done the work before and which ones might be suitable to consider for further testing. Okay, so that's what we've just um, said. We also have to prioritize what we find and figure out how to work with them. Again, hearing from you, how do we determine that natural enemies are safe to use? What is it that we um, researchers have to do? Yeah, we do our host specificity testing. Sometimes in the Pacific, we don't need to do any additional testing because everything that needs to be tested has already been tested, but we will check through that. We will make sure uh, in your country that you don't have any plants that are particularly unusual or different that haven't been tested that might be at risk. So again, the key points are that this host specificity is actually really common in insects and pathogens. And it's all around using similar chemicals for defense. People often don't understand this point and they think about the generalist insects and the generalist pathogens, but actually most insects and plant diseases are not like that. And we have our internationally accepted guidelines for testing and we have to come up with an appropriate testing regime. But for many of these natural enemies, we don't need to do much testing, if anything. So now what can you tell me um, with the next step, importation, what kinds of information do we include in an import risk assessment? When we're at that stage in the proceedings where we can look to get permission to import and release a natural enemy in your country. What kinds of things do we need to put into the import risk assessment?
maybe this is one that um, people have forgotten. Well, I can just remind you about that. We need to weigh up all the risks, costs and benefits. So we need to provide um, very thorough information, all the things that a regulator is going to need to make a decision. So that's a whole lot of background information about the weed, about the natural enemy, and all of the, 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 the supporting data so that they can make a decision and weigh up those risks, costs, and benefits. And also important to point out that if your regulators lack expertise to be able to make a decision, we can find independent experts from part of the weed biocontrol community um, globally who are not, not involved in any of these projects, who are completely independent, and we can ask them to provide advice. And that can be a really useful way forward. So the next step after that is importing, rearing and releasing. We talked about the importance of making sure that natural enemies go through a containment so that they are not contaminated with any unwanted other organisms. And we're very careful when we bring the shipments in that we don't bring anything inadvertently in the packaging. Again, we would like to hear from you about what can you remember about the key success factors for mass rearing natural enemies. Michael talked about um, this on Friday, I think it was, Friday in New Zealand, Thursday, other parts of uh, the Pacific. What were some of the key things? The weather can be really important for um, when you're making the releases. You don't want to put out um, your natural enemies when the cyclone's on its way. Good planning, absolutely. Michael's a great stickler for planning and keeping really good records and dates and times and amounts. And so you can go back and look at, um, yeah, maybe where, where did something go wrong? Left, left the natural enemies on a, on a plant for too long, didn't put enough, put too many. And yes, choosing many release sites is uh, another really important one. You don't want to put all your eggs in one basket, is the saying. If we choose a number of um, release sites, we should be lucky and get success at, um, a successful establishment in at least one. Also, yes, humidity can be really important for um, having the correct level of humidity, particularly for things like plant diseases. And um, yeah, what have we forgotten? Yeah, the ability to grow and maintain healthy plants and careful attention to detail and also choosing the best possible release sites. So just one more question for you around the steps. Why do we actually need to do a follow-up assessment at the end? Why do we need to bother to go back to where we release the natural enemies. Yeah, we need to measure success. We need to be able to tell our story. We need to also know if the natural enemies are not being effective because it might be that there is more than one natural enemy and we might need to bring maybe a second natural enemy in to boost the level of attack. We also, um, as best practice, always check for non-target attack. And just to show we're being very thorough, we are confident they're not going to attack other plants, but we go and we collect data about that. So yeah, we need to check they've established and if they're providing adequate control. And the other key point we we're, we're putting forward a very simple approach to doing this because we know it can be difficult to do the monitoring and evaluation. So what we're looking at um, is an approach where we just measure big changes in weed infestations using photos and estimates of extent and density and showing how these change over time. And then finally, we talked about determining a program of work and there are steps that you can follow here 
um, to to come up with the prioritised list of natural enemies to work on for your country. So we're just going to move on now to some closing thoughts. I talked um, last week about our vision of a strong network of people throughout the Pacific, confidently using NENS, sharing lessons, stories, natural enemies and expertise to reduce the harmful impacts of invasive weeds. And on our very first session, you put pins in the map and look at all those blue pins. Look at the startings that we have here of this network. Um, it's been fantastic to see how many countries have engaged with this online training and there were some pins um, not here because people joined us um, after the first session. I think this vision is actually very achievable. We need to think about what we're going to call ourselves. Dave Moverley is the master of the acronym but I'm just putting out there for a start PNN. If you can think of something better, please share it. Uh, Temo has very kindly set up a Facebook page for Pacific NENS. Please um, join us if you would like to be part of this Facebook group and this is a way we'll be able to have ongoing conversations, talk about what we're doing, talk about other opportunities and information and, and um, so on. There's also um, another Facebook that you might like to be part of and this is the Pacific Invasive Spatlers Facebook page which Sprett manage. If you want to be part of this one, um, contact Joseph and there's his um, email there and ask if you can be included in this Facebook. Um, again, they, the Pacific Invasive Battlers are battling more than just weeds and some of you may be interested in some of the other invasive species work as well. But we have these two Facebook pages that we can use to start this network and to, to keep this um, conversation going and alive. Um, I'm just going to ask you just for a couple more um, bits of input. How useful has this online training been for you? Great, lovely to see that. Five. Should we organise a follow-up Q&A session. So what we could do is just be online and you can come and just ask us any questions that you want face to face. Obviously the questions using the Zoom like this was, was more difficult. We couldn't have you asking us, but it's worked pretty well I think with the submitting questions. So there's pretty strong support there for us to organise a follow-up session or sessions where you can just ask us more things, pick more brains. Other sessions that you might be interested in, we can organise more of this online training. I know there was some um, interest, for example, in cost benefit. And we have talked about a session where we can tell you more about the natural enemies that are available or might be available. Are there other things that you would like us to cover or we'll cover in more detail? Rearing of natural enemies, scoring training. I'm not sure what that NENS for pests uh, is. Is that maybe NENS for things more than weeds? That's not our area of expertise, but we might be able to find somebody who could talk about that. Weed ID, case studies. Thank you. Can you give us three words to describe NENS? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Sustainable. Safe, reliable. Sustainable is a big, coming up very big. Last chance, yes, well, we did talk about the fact that doing nothing against these invasive weeds is not an option. It's not an option. 
natural, awesome, saves lives, yes. Fantastic, thank you. Give us your word for goodbye. But if you have a word for goodbye that's not forever, but hopefully we'll see you again soon, <laughs> give us that word. I'm not even going to try and um, pronounce all of these. You're going to have to um, give me some um, some lessons when we come to visit you. Fantastic. I'm just going to make some acknowledgements now. Um, this online training was made possible because of the New Zealand um, Ministry for Foreign Affairs and Trade. Um, I think they are going to be very interested in trying to support more of this work. And one of the things that we need to do to, to help them to be supportive is to give them some evidence um, that this training was useful. So we'll be sending out uh, another Mentimeter questionnaire where we can just get some um, feedback from you and also some stats. They're always really interested in who turned up in terms of gender and age and so on. So um, please, when that email comes through, could each of the people who participated complete that um, questionnaire or get at least one person in the room where there was lots of you to do it on behalf of you all. That will be really helpful to us and helpful for getting further funding and support for this work.